Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. This time we bring in Michael Hecker. Hello, Michael. How are you? Hey, Danny. Thank you for having me. I'm fine. Excellent. And today we're going to be speaking about um, PPC automation, yeah? That's right. Excellent. So before we get started, remember, guys, you can like, subscribe, and leave a comment below, and me and Michael will come back to you. Okay, so let's get into this. We're going to be talking about PPC automation. It's not very much spoken about in terms of Amazon. Obviously, you've got uh, tools for AdWords, etc. out there, third-party tools uh, that deals with bid management and things like that. So it, a lot of people have got software that they're using, or they manage it in spreadsheet, but they're not really doing full-on automation. So before we start with the automation, let me give us a bit of background on yourself, where you're based, etc. Okay, sure. So uh, I started to really dig into the Amazon marketplace back in 2013. Uh, back then, I were developing a dynamic pricing solution for a company builder here in Munich. And uh, yeah, the general mindset back then was uh, pretty growth oriented, VC oriented. So um, that company builder had two portfolio companies and we used that software for them. But uh, we had a situation where we had a pretty universal technology, but we were just using it for like two market segments. And so I decided to start my own company, which is uh, called Quantified Markets. And uh, after uh, starting the company, uh, I started to talk to a number of sellers and uh, actually, their response was not quite what I expected. Uh, if you want to uh, summarize, there were like two key aspects. Uh, the first one was they said, you need dynamic pricing, especially when a, a category is extremely competitive. So we were in a situation where the need for a technology or the need for the solution increases when the market segment as a whole becomes less attractive. And the second finding was that um, the whole uh, manufacturers going direct to consumer, the whole private uh, uh, private label owner um, movement really started to gain momentum. And um, that's why I made three decisions. Uh, the first one was to really go all in on, on Amazon. Um, back then, we were work, uh, working at the same time on a solution for eBay and for Amazon. Uh, but... Uh, I just thought that the, the clean product catalog of Amazon is really an advantage it has in, in contrast to eBay. So I decided to go all in. The second decision was that um, I think like the traditional role of wholesale and retail is like distribution or allocation if you want. And I think that role changes um, or is, is significantly changed by the marketplaces. So I decided to bet on brand owners, manufacturers and sellers. And the third decision was that um, my focus or my playing field will not be the typical buy box battle, but instead uh, increasing visibility. So reverse engineering the A9 algorithm, the ranking algorithm. And um, yeah, back then we, we um, started pretty broad doing everything from quantitative product development um, over marketing to automating a few um, customer care related uh, processes. Um, but about a year ago, a, one of our clients called and basically said, well, Michael, we have an ad spend of around 30,000 euros a month and we don't have an idea where the, where the money is going. Can you do something about it? Uh, I know today this sounds completely strange, but um, back then you had like an average cost per click of around two or three cents. So back then it was like the dominant strategy to just book everything you can. But then like market prices increased and then there were a lot of sellers in this same situation. So the first step was to work on the controlling so that we really get transparency. Uh, I know some of you guys are not really that much into into like controlling and digging into the numbers, but it's really it's really the foundation. You need the transparency. Cool. And the next step. So should we break into that? To, should we talk about your five pillars here? Uh, we can. Uh, I think I would just have like two more sentences, and uh, so, yeah, after that, 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 would, that yeah. would be like the perfect bridge for you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Four. Okay. Uh, so the first step was to uh, work on the controlling. I know uh, some of you guys are not that much into digging into the numbers, but um, 
controlling or having the transparency is really um, key, is really the, the foundation. And then when you know how um, efficient a keyword is, whether it is profitable or not, uh, then the next step was to automate the bid management. After that, we started to work on the on the keyword research. And then sooner or later, you've got like automated the complete process. And that's where we are today. And that's why today our focus is completely on uh, sponsored products automation. So without further ado, let's get into the PPC automation and discuss from end to end. Now, your first step you mentioned to me is keyword calculation. Do you want to go into that for yeah. me? Yeah, so um, keyword calculation is actually an important um, step because uh, right now I think a lot of you guys are doing some kind of manual research, looking at top sellers. Um, yeah, every one of you probably has uh, his or her own own process, but this process becomes really complicated when we are talking about really large product portfolios, about like 20, 30,000 products and upwards. And when we are talking about uh, a huge number of marketplaces, so many languages. So the whole process has to be completely based on numbers and has to be completely automated. And that's basically what we've done. And uh, the process basically has two steps. The first one is you are uh, calculating keyword candidates. And you can do that by analyzing the Amazon search recommendations, the suggestions. The second source is you can analyze uh, top seller data, so which words and word combinations are more frequent uh, in those top sellers in a specific product category. And the third um, data source is actually the most valuable one, and that are the search term reports. So from your campaign reports, from those search term reports, you exactly know which exact search query generated how many impressions, and that's extremely valuable uh, when you're analyzing search behavior. Excellent. So, so that's like the, the first step, having those candidates. And then the second step is actually equally important. That's calculating the keyword relevance. So let's, um, let's take, for example, the keyword women. If you are searching for women, then you'll probably find all kinds of um, pants, blouses, um, purses, um, shoes, all kinds of products. So for none of those products or product categories, the keyword women has a really high relevance. In contrast, if you would search for um, women sneakers um, size eight, um, then you would just find those sneakers. And so consequently, that keyword has a really high relevancy for uh, sneakers for women. So, um, and, and that second step is actually uh, so important because when we are analyzing your search term reports, then we exactly know for which search queries Amazon is displaying your ads. So um, let me uh, let me let me find an example in English. Um, let's say you were booking um, vegan, yeah, because you've got a um, vegan cosmetics product, a um, a hair oil or a or body oil, yeah, and and um, then it could happen that Amazon is showing your ads for if someone searches for a vegan cookbook, but the query vegan cookbook is not relevant for a vegan body oil. So it's important to analyze those search queries, detect irre irrelevant search queries, so that you can put them on your negative keyword list uh, and thereby optimize your um, in the investment of your marketing budget. Excellent. And what's the next step after that? So the next uh, step is the uh, product data optimization. I know product data optimization is one of those buzzwords often used. Um, let's um, like let's be really precise here. So the idea is actually pretty simple. If we book a lot of keywords, a typical keyword set for a product contains around two to three thousand um, keywords. If we would just book all of those keywords, then around 96% of those keywords wouldn't generate a single impression. So the uh, re goal really is to help Amazon understand that your product is relevant for this specific keyword or search query. And the way we do that is by basically cutting your complete keyword set into slices. And then um, we can take one of those slices, um, like optimize the search term attribute that we are going to update, and then we are sending the, the data to Amazon. And this way, 
week by week, we can test a different slice out of this keyword set. And after testing all of the slices, we exactly know with which keyword you can generate which reach, uh, what's the cost, how good does it convert. And that's like really the, uh, the foundation you need for the, for the further process. Fantastic. And so obviously we, we were talking about automation here. Uh, uh, yeah. this, is, this is basically a manual process, a lot of these at the beginning, apart from the data slicing, would you say this is the manual stages to get to the automation? Well, the, the goal really is, or not the goal, like the status quo is to automate or to have automated all of or the, like the complete process. Yes. So what, what the program does is just to... Um, to keep the uh, sneakers for women example, uh, let's say you had like the keyword um, women sneaker size something, women sneaker uh, white, um, and and other keywords. Then the question is, how do you um, insert or how do you build the string you are going to insert into um, the search terms attribute? And um, there are. As far as I know, two possible strategies. I've uh, prepared a um, simple slide here. And what we are comparing here is strategy one, the all keywords found strategy. So with this strategy, we are removing all duplicate keywords so that we can insert more unique keywords into the search term attributes, uh, in the search terms attribute. And the second strategy is the exact match strategy. So we have duplicate keywords in our search term attribute, but the advantage of this strategy is that when someone searches for that search query, then Amazon can find the exact string in your product data, and that's why the relevancy of your product is higher than um, in comparison to the all keywords found strategy. And in the chart, you can actually see that if you apply the exact match strategy, you are generating more impressions uh, for each keyword, but the downside is you have uh, less unique words, so you are generating key, uh, traffic with uh, fewer keywords, but the Focused. traffic per keyword is actually higher. Yeah, excellent. Okay, and then how, what would we do? What, what's your next stage from there? Yeah, okay, so uh, as soon as we know the keywords we are uh, going to book, the next step is to actually create the campaign. That uh, sounds pretty straightforward, but there are a few things we are doing a little bit different than a lot of other people do. And um, just to be completely uh, transparent here for you. So the first thing we are doing differently is we are actually just creating two campaigns. So I know a lot of you guys are creating campaigns for each single brand or each single product category. Uh, you might have a broad match campaign, a phrase and an exact match campaign. So a lot of campaigns. The problem with such a high number of campaigns is actually that um, the, just to keep, uh, to, to stay with the uh, match type example, um, we are booking keywords with a specific match type, but at the end of the day, Amazon has to decide for a specific search query whether they are showing our ad or not. And the problem I'm talking about here is called um, collusion. So uh, just to stay in the example with the sneakers, if you are booking uh, women's sneaker white as an exact keyword match, and at the same time you are booking sneaker as a broad match, then at first glance, it might seem that we're, you are talking here about two completely different keywords, but both both of those keywords actually match for the search query uh, women's sneaker white. Yeah. So the problem is that uh, your bid management simply becomes unprecise because uh, the the bid management program can't be sure which whether one to the go for. Yeah. which one to go for exactly. Yeah. And to reduce the risk of collusion, you just have to reduce the number of campaigns. So just one campaign for your manual targeting campaigns and one um, campaign for your auto targeting campaign. And the, the second thing we are doing differently is um, we are actually um, creating an ad group for every single product, every single SKU, which sounds strange because the name is ad group. But the reason uh, is that in, in the controlling, in the reporting, Amazon differentiates between total sales and same SKU sales. So if you have multiple product ads in your ad group, then you know that the product you advertise was actually sold, but you don't know which of those products you sold. And to have that exact one-to-one -one match, 
you always need to have like just a single SKU per ad group. Excellent. Okay. And then there's a, a phase, phase four is controlling. What is controlling and how does it work? Yeah. Well, yeah, there are two aspects to it. The first one is to give you the seller, the brand owner, the decision maker, the um, the, the data so that you can um, like evaluate your performance. How is my profitability? How is my reach developing? Um, how is my my CPC and and so on? And based on um, those numbers, you simply have to decide on on four parameters. The first one is which products am I going to promote in which countries? Sometimes people have um, yeah products with a very low average basket. When the average basket is really low, it's difficult um, to get that ad profitable simply because the, your absolute margin is going to be pretty low as well. So that's why sometimes you want to exclude some products. So and after deciding on the products, the next step is to decide about your uh, campaign budget. Then you need a target ACOS. So what's the profitability you're trying to, to achieve? Uh, actually, the, the ACOS is uh, basically the most important parameter because if you're choosing a higher ACOS, then you're having higher cost per click, you're generating more reach, more traffic, and thereby more yeah, revenue growth, more, more orders. Uh, but at the same time, if you would decrease your target ACOS, your CPCs decrease and thereby your profitability increases. So with a, with a single parameter, you can prioritize between growth and profitability. Fantastic. And, and last but not least, uh, the um, bid management based on an ACOS only works when you know how well a specific keyword converts. When we are creating the campaign for the first time, you don't have that data. So that's why at the beginning you need a default cost per click. And with those four parameters, you can basically control the whole system. Right. Okay. So what does, I mean, I know it's sound like a silly question, but now you've gone through all those steps, there's a set of setup procedures to make all of these pop. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about. What is Actually, the uh, sorry, oh, sorry sorry for uh, I think like uh, we missed the the fifth part which is the bit management yeah sorry I, let's, I, let's let's cover the bid management that's fine yeah so let's go into the more detail graphic detail and bid management and then we yeah. can look at the the full picture so talk me through how the bid management works for you okay so the goal of the bid management is to decide on a price for every single keyword so one thing a lot of people are doing wrong is they are basically falling in love with some keywords, their primary keywords. Uh, then they simply look at the suggested bids Amazon provides. And uh, consequently, they are setting extremely high prices, something like two or three pounds, which can never be profitable if the product has an average basket of something like 20, 25 pounds. So the, the goal is to take really all of the emotion out of, out of the process and simply decide based on your target ACOS, and the revenue you are generating per click on which precise price um, you should you should set, and that's uh, that is done in the in the bid management process. Okay, and so if I understand this right, you're looking for a, a, a basically a guide on terms of CPC per keyword, yeah. So, yeah. what kind of level of calculation would someone have to do? Let's say you have got a large account with lots of keywords. Yeah. Mathematically, how would someone at home? or yeah. in their business, what's the best way of approaching that to, to calculate? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think the process I just described, the, or the beauty of that process is that in theory, every one of you could do it by hand. Yeah. The challenge really is in, in scaling this. Yes. Because uh, just to give you an example, one of our partners has just got 40 products that it's not something so extreme, but they are generating uh, traffic with um, 2.6 million different search queries. So let's just take the simple process of evaluating the search queries, which of those are relevant, which are not, which of those should we add to our negative keywords. If you got that many search queries, then it's basically impossible to do that manually. Of course. Yeah. And, and the, the second problem is, um, once again, language. So um, if, if you are active in, in more um, marketplaces, then you would have to have staff which is um, capable of, of speaking all of those languages. So that would just add a lot of overhead and fixed cost to your, to your um, total payroll. Okay, and so that's something we can automate. 
Th- yeah, so that's good. So let's talk about the automation. You've gone through all those steps. What does it look like on the customer end, the I- i.e. the Amazon seller? Yeah. You know, you've got everything set up. Is there a, a is it machine learning? Is there their self optimization over a period mm-hmm. of time? What's the next step? Yeah. Okay. So uh, to answer your first question uh, concerning the the web interface, uh, my answer might surprise you because right now there is no web interface. Yeah. And and many people are surprised because when you're looking at the current market, then there are a lot of great tools which help you analyze your performance. There are a lot of charts and and graphs. But the um, the goal I was trying to achieve is that. The seller does not have to learn a new interface um, and configure a whole lot, but the whole system is just configured with those four parameters. So we are like pulling all of the data Amazon provides, then we are doing all the calculations based on the, the parameters you've chosen, and then we are transferring all the results back to Amazon. So as a seller, you can see right from the seller central everything that's going on. You can see the, all the campaigns, uh, the ad groups, the book keywords, the CPC. So you've got full transparency from within the seller central. Okay, so um, AWS, plug, it plugs in on the back end of to your seller central account. But on the front end, you're, you're, the, the customer is not the Amazon seller customer or client is not managing any of the campaigns you're doing that all remotely or your team is doing it remotely but they're seeing in real time changes happen within their dashboard is that what you're saying Uh, actually uh not real time but you know it's over Uh, like uh if you would talk about like a traditional agency about bit management, yeah. then they would probably tell you that uh, from time to time you have those calls with your customers where they say, well, why is uh, my CPC for keyword X 20 pence and not 22 pence or something like this? Yeah. And that's a conversation uh, I so far never had with one of my partners because the, the goal is to really invest a lot of time into explaining all of the processes. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as the seller has that transparency, it's not a black box anymore, but you're like, you can trust in the, in the efficiency of the system. And, and that's why you don't need to talk about like each keyword individually. This would basically be impossible. Uh, Just to, to give you an example here, there actually is a limit of 2 million keywords you can book per country that might sound like a look uh, like a, a lot, but yeah. if you've got a portfolio of something like 20,000 um, products, then you would simply have, uh, hope it's, uh, it's calculated correct, uh, something like 100 keywords per product. So th- that's not a lot. Yeah. Okay. So what I suppose really the the word I'm probably looking for is like you've got an agency there, which let's call it Blue Ocean. It's one of those whereby you've got, um, a lot of agencies out there are very good at what they do and they've got smaller teams, but they simply can't manage 100, 200 SKUs uh, because it's not cost-effective effect, cost for their clients as Amazon businesses if they're charging per SKU and stuff. So where your standout is because there's automation, you're able to offer a service for a lot more SKUs at a reduced cost, but manage a higher level through calculation, Yeah. Just uh, just to give you one like example uh, mm-hmm. where like the manual process of a, a standard uh, agency simply wouldn't work, uh, and that example is the the standard apparel case. Yeah. Uh, so clothing. Yeah. yeah. So in clothing, you usually have a lot of product uh, variations because you have all of your products in different sizes and different colors. Mm-hmm. So the important thing is that uh, let's take the example of a um, pullover for for men. Yeah. So you might have that pullover in various colors like black, blue, and red. Yeah. So your customers will have different preferences for all of those um, products. Usually like the black is uh, black pullover is more preferred than, than the red one. And a, a stronger preference reflects in higher conversion rates, uh, thereby lower customer acquisition costs and consequently a higher um, target cost per click you would or a higher willingness to pay yeah so now the problem becomes more difficult because like the preference of a customer depends on the on the search query if someone searches for pullover red men's then obviously he's looking for for a red pullover so you have to do all of those analysis 
on a on a keyword basis for large portfolios in many languages and that's something which is impossible to do by hand okay so let me throw a little curveball here let me give you an example how would you manage say the keyword glass and glasses because yeah. of the multiple meanings of the categories that are in the glasses is like you can have six beakers glass beakers yeah. and then you could have glasses that you wear you got a manual override or what? How would that work? Uh, there are um, two aspects to it. The first one is uh, usually we would never book both of them because um, while the um, keyword candidate algorithm might uh, generate both of those uh, keyword suggestions, the keyword relevancy rank uh, algorithm, uh, algorithm would um, see that those glasses are only relevant for the glasses you can wear and the glass is and the keyword glass is relevant to a completely different category. So usually, or usually is not really the right word, we we wouldn't book both of those keywords at the same time. Yeah. That's step one. And the second step is the bit management process. If for some reason there would be both, both keywords, the uh, program would um, see that click-through rates and conversion rates for the wrong term are extremely low. Mm -hmm. Consequently, your cost per click or your bid would um, would be decreased and uh, then sooner or later the keyword wouldn't generate any traffic anymore. Right. Okay, cool. And how do you determine, like what we just said, you know, like you said, you wouldn't book, I like that word that you use, you wouldn't book that keyword, um, yeah. like glass and glasses, but how would you determine that if it's automated? And what I mean by that. With all the keywords you're harvesting and separating and 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 putting them into their little channels, yep. who is reviewing that? That must be a manual process, like a human's going, ah, oh, glass, yeah. glasses. Yeah. Now, uh, once again, that's that's automated. So um, there are actually two um, possible ways to do that. Yep. The first one is the software um, searches for the keyword glass and glasses in, in this respect. It uh, identifies all the products recommended. And then as a first step, we could analyze the product categorization of all of those products. Mm -hmm. And then we can see how many of those products we found were in which category. Right. So, gotcha. so that's like the, the first approach. And the second approach would be that if you are regularly crawling a really large uh, keyword set, so 20, 30 and more million uh, keywords. Um, what would happen is that you um, regularly find um, products like products of different um, brands together in the search results. So you'd find like product neighbors or product uh, competitors in the search results. And based on that data, you can um, you can calculate how similar two products are. And then, once again, you can use that data to assess the relevancy of a keyword for a specific product. Gotcha. And so let's just change it up slightly, bearing in mind that you are, you've got visibility on a huge amount of data sets because of what you're harvesting, not harvesting, but what you're learning from because the amount of keywords that you're using is way out the hands of a, like a general seller who might have 10 private label products and he's in two countries, for instance. Let's just say they're in the UK and they're in the US. Now, it's difficult if they're not using an agency to manage and work on their campaigns. And obviously, they'll read Facebook posts of people doing this, that, and the other. Um, the, the general consensus is we know that uh, Jeff's earned a fortune in the billions in terms of um, sponsored ads, like last year. What was the turnover? Do you have a number on that? Was it 1.5 billion or something? That Amazon, I would have to look that up. Well. Yeah. So they're earning a huge amount of money, and there's not always going to be winners. So what are you? What advice can you give to Amazon sellers? Are the kind of guys who go right? I'm going after the main keyword because yeah. I want that correlation of ranking. Obviously, I want to get the visibility work, work done first. So I bid high on that keyword. I lose lots of money. I'll sell through that keyword. My sales rise, and etc. Yeah. etc. Et you know the story. Yeah. What do you see with that as someone like stepping back? You've got all yeah. your competitors and then your machine comes along <laughs> and goes, <laughs> we sweep all of this up and yeah. we've got this tool to manage more effectively than you can as a human being. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing there? I mean, are you literally clearing up in the markets or are you seeing common mistakes, what people are doing constantly? 
Well, there are, there are basically two answers to it. The, the first one is a, a pretty general one, uh, because in the first place, you should um, ensure that you really have a great product. So uh, if you've got a bad product, bad quality at an extremely high price, then yes, we could create ads for that product, but your customer acquisition cost, uh, your ACOS will be so extremely high that it's not profitable at all. So in the long term, you would simply lose a lot of money. So it makes uh, sense to invest that time into product development, product quality, into the into the quality of your listing to really make sure that the customer has all the information he or she needs so that your expected conversion rate is is high enough. Uh, just to, to give you a, um, a, a point of reference here, uh, in Europe, the average conversion rate we are seeing is 2.85%. Uh, so if you see that your conversion rate is significantly lower, somewhere around 1.5% or even lower, then I think I would spend more time on optimizing my listing before thinking a lot about ads. It's actually uh, like a, a question I'm uh, asked quite frequently is what's the perfect time on on when or when you should you start your ads for a product and there are two sides to it if a product is further down its life cycle then you already got a number of reviews you've got a high rating um, you've got that track record so your ads will be far more profitable on the other hand how do you get how do you get your product into that life cycle and so so it makes sense to like launch a product or push a product into the market so you can definitely do that with ads but you have to keep in mind that at the beginning your profitability will be a little lower than during the later stages of the of the funnel yeah. of the of the um, product life cycle yeah i think with with a lot of um like we all want profitable campaigns we all want sexy a costs um but it's not there's no guarantees like you said you can't polish yeah. a turd so you need a great product yeah. So the, the way I look at stuff is that you need a great product for a start. You also need very good uh, in terms of understanding your customer. So price optimization is really key because I think where people fall in love with their products or their product costs go up, they suddenly go from what is a fair price product to a, oh, right, I'm going to make this a uh, premium product now because my costs are shot up, which the market won't necessarily suffer that. The other thing is the relevance to your keywords mm. and also is your message on song in terms of congruency. And I think yeah. they all play uh, a big role as well is like what you were saying now. So yeah. just but, uh, just to uh, like add one aspect to the uh, sexy echoes uh, you were mentioning. Yes. Uh, like when you're reading those blogs or when you're active in those uh, Amazon Facebook groups, then from time to time you will see a screenshot um showing an ACOS of something like 1%, 2%. Yeah. And people always go crazy and, and say, how do you do that? Uh, how do you get such an ACOS? And what you have to keep in mind is that every category and every country is extremely different. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, if you are selling cosmetics or perfumes, then this is a category where like the market share of brand products is extremely high and those products are usually sold via traditional retailers. Those retailers usually have a profit margin of something like five to seven percent. So if the profit margin of the of the retailer is so low, then of course his his ad spend or his maximum ACOS has to be significantly lower as well. And that's why you are seeing really low CPCs and really low ACOS in those uh, categories. Yeah. On the other hand, if you are a private label fashion uh, manufacturer or private label brand owners, uh, owner, then your, your profit margin is much higher and consequently you will see higher CPCs and higher ACOS in the, in the market as well. So really, really work with the, with the data you've got and, and um, start optimizing from there. Cool. And so let's just wrap here on, give us three key things that everyone should be doing in terms of PPC, yeah. in your opinion, with all the data that you've seen, yeah. give us some unique insights that you've seen from yeah. big data. Yeah. Okay. So uh, learning number one is it's extremely important that right now you uh, switch to that one SKU per ad group strategy. The reason is 
when you're giving a software provider, me for example, access to your data, then we can download the data of, of the last 60 days. But the value of the data really depends on whether the campaign structure is right. And if you've got multiple product ads, then the value of that data, the data is significantly lower. So number one, do the uh, have the right campaign structure. Then aspect number two is invest into your keyword research. Um, I've, I've got a chart for here, Danny, um, which um, shows the results of, of a test we ran. Uh, we basically booked a large keyword set containing uh, 20,000 keywords, and we booked those keywords via uh, Google AdWords and via Amazon sponsored products. What the chart shows is the price difference between the Google CPC and the, the Amazon CPC. And what you can see are actually three things. The first thing is the general price level of Amazon is still really attractive. On average, the, the Amazon CPC was uh, 23 cents lower than uh, the Google CPC. And it's the, on platform as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually an important aspect because if the, if the customer is already on Amazon, he it has a higher willingness to do a purchase. Mm. So the expected conversion rate is higher as well. So lower, uh, lower CPC and higher conversion rate is, is always uh, something we are pretty interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the second aspect was uh, that the um, price differences, the uh, price difference is increasing when the search volume per keyword is going down. So to put this in other words, the, the long tail is basically undervalued. So if you are investing your time into, into keyword research, finding those long tail keywords, then it really pays off. And the third aspect is we already spoke about uh, falling in love with some keywords. What you can see in the chart is that those uh, fat hat keywords, those primary keywords, everyone comes up with just out of their head, those ha have really high CPCs and those CPCs are actually even higher than um, the Google AdWords CPCs for, for those keywords. So have the right campaign structure, uh, analyze your um, keywords, um, book especially long tail keywords, and then have a structured um, bid management process so that you are investing your money into the keywords which really uh, convert and generate orders for you. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll wrap it there. But um, how can people reach you? Because, example, our audience are made up of Amazon sellers from, say, 10,000 a month to half a million. And I'm sure yeah. the guys at the, at the higher end with, with multiple SKUs and stuff may, may be looking for uh, resolving issues of managing 100, 150 SKUs. So yeah. how can these people reach you? Uh, actually, the, the easiest way to reach me is uh, via email. My yeah. uh, address is michael at uh, quantifiedmarkets.com. Yeah. And uh, just um, to add one aspect to the uh, larger seller point you were making, um, what I've learned over the last um, month is that usually um, the, the need to automate your sponsored products is increasing when your product portfolio is larger, when you're selling in more countries, in, in multiple countries, or when your ad spend is higher. So especially when your ad spend is high, we're talking about £6,000 and upwards, sky's the limit, uh, then uh, that's usually like the ideal setting on when to talk about um, automation. Excellent. Okay, guys, thanks again for joining us. Michael, again, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment, and me and Michael will come back to you, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, bye. Goodbye.